I will do that then. Yeah, thank you, Paul. As I was saying, uh, this session is sort of a uh, continues some similar themes in what Sergio was talking about. We'll be talking about Micronaut. We're going to talk about JHipster, which is a way of creating a Micronaut application. And uh, we'll talk about how you can introduce Groovy into that and a little bit about the Groovy interoperability with Micronaut as well as um, in other uh, when using other Java languages or JVM languages. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm trying to decide what can I do the slides from here? Nope, I can't. So I'm going to start my slideshow. All right, then we're off. All right. So thank you for joining me. This is uh, my name is Zachary Klein. I'm a senior software engineer at Object Computing uh, Incorporated, which is the uh, sponsor, corporate sponsor for both the Grails and Micronaut frameworks, as well as the sponsor of the Apache Groovy programming language. So um, a little bit about me. I'm just going to jump right into the agenda. So we're going to be talking about Micronaut. We're going to be talking about uh, JHipster. And we're going to be talking about Groovy. Those are really our agenda items. And Groovy is going to be sort of a, it, uh, what we're going to talk about. It, we're going to have a quick introduction of Micronaut. We're not going to go into much detail because I'm hoping that you either saw, you were just in Sergio's last session, uh, or if not, you can watch the recording and get a quick introduction to the Micronaut framework and what it has to offer in particular around its Groovy support. We're going to talk about JHipster as well. And um, but let's go right into Micronaut uh, first. So what is Micronaut? Uh, it's, we describe Micronaut as a framework for building microservice and serverless applications. Um, Micronaut is all about compile time processing, compile time analysis. It's a framework that instead of doing a lot of frame, a lot of magic at runtime through the use of proxies and caches and so forth, Micronaut analyzes your code at compilation time. It uses, in the case of Groovy, it uses AST transformations to do that an analysis. And then it creates the additional bytecode necessary to add things like transaction handling or caching or HTTP requests, HTTP um, logic. All that's generated for you in bytecode at compilation time without modifying your code um, and without a lot of runtime processing. Micronaut is natively reactive. It's built on the, the Netty HTTP library. Um, it offers a declarative HTTP client. If you were in my Grails 4 talk, you would have seen that client already. And we describe it as natively cloud native, uh, meaning that Micronaut is built uh, with distributed systems and cloud computing in mind. And so there's a lot of features that are included in the framework to make those sorts of applications uh, really a breeze to develop. Um, and there's a whole suite of both official and community contributed integrations or configurations and other libraries uh, adding things like security and interaction with mess it, uh, integration with messaging systems, lots of cool stuff. So what or not? Well, you really can build anything you can build with Java. Uh, Micronaut, while it is designed primarily with microservices and serverless in mind, um, it's applicable. Uh, the the Grails uh, 4, for example, makes use of Micronaut in its foundation. Um, Android and CLI applications, really anything that's got a static void main can use Micronaut to provide things like compile time dependency injection, aspect oriented programming, configuration injection. And so there's a lot of really cool applications that can take advantage of Micronaut. What makes Micronaut different? Well, I already mentioned ahead of time compilation. It's a framework that does the framework magic while your app is being compiled rather than when your app is started up or while it is running. That means no reflection. There's no reflection needed to introspect um, classes and objects at runtime. Uh, there's no need for runtime proxying or dynamic class loading or for metadata caching and so forth. That also makes Micronaut a great fit for Growl VM, which is an alternative JVM that a lot of folks are excited about, very high performance, natively reactive, capable of running in low memory environments. Again, that's also important in cloud computing when you're paying for resources, Micronaut will bring down your resource uh, requirements. And then Micronaut is polyglot. Um, it is, uh, it supports Groovy, Java and Kotlin all as first class languages. And that what that means is that you can use those languages to write the Micronaut specific artifacts, controllers, filters, uh, anything that any type of class that Micronaut supports, you can write it in any of these three languages, including Groovy. And as I mentioned already, uh, it makes use of um, AST transformations 
in, the, in, uh, in order to provide that groovy support, which is super cool. For Java and Kotlin, the same features are provided using uh, Java annotation processors. So slightly different approach, but the same, uh, same general results. And then there's configurations available for all sorts of other uh, of, of really cool libraries and platforms, uh, data access, open API, Swagger documentation, super cool. With Micronauts open API uh, support, you can analyze your controllers and generate really cool um, uh, interactive documentation from your code. So you don't actually have to write the Swagger um, documentation yourself. Uh, you can certainly supply additional metadata if you wish, but it's able to actually you know, do a lot of, of work simply by analyzing your controllers at compile time. So what about Micronaut and Groovy? So I already said Micronaut has first class support for the Groovy programming language. And that means that uh, you can create a Micronaut application entirely using Groovy. Uh, the application class, the main class is a Groovy class. Controllers, filters, any type of bean can be written uh, using uh, Groovy, including uh, factories and configuration properties. You can supply configuration using a Groovy file. So by default uh, in Grails, for example, and Spring Boot, uh, YAML has become a very popular configuration uh, format. However, there are advantages to using Groovy for configuration, especially if you have to do any programmatic, you know, string substitutions, or you might want to do more interesting things um, in your configuration file than just a bunch of key value pairs. And so in those cases, uh, you can use Groovy to supply your application configuration. We'll see an example of that shortly. Um, it uh, also means that we have uh, support for, great support for Spock. So testing in Micra is in general very uh, pleasant and very easy. And hopefully you saw some of that in Sergio's last talk if you were there. Um, but uh, in addition to the ease of firing up a embedded server and, and actually running your Micronaut runtime and your Micronaut uh, server within the scope of your test, there's also the Micronaut test library, which gives you a, a really sweet annotation. You just put it on your Spock test or your JUnit test and it will automatically start up your application context and allow you to directly inject beans into your test with no mocking uh, needed. And so uh, Micronaut test does support Spock. And so you can, even in a Micronaut application that is written in Java, for example, you can still use Spock and use Groovy for your testing, uh, which is a very popular combination. And I already mentioned that Micronaut makes use of AST transformations uh, when, you're, when you're using Groovy. So it, uh, those AST transformations will uh, walk through your code base, they'll find the controller actions, they'll find the HTTP client methods, they'll find caching, they'll find the various framework features that Micronaut is going to handle for you, and it's going to create the bytecode needed to add that behavior, add that functionality, um, or add that, that, that those aspect-oriented um, programming um, uh, features, all at compilation time. So your compilation time does uh, take a little longer, perhaps, uh, by milliseconds to seconds, but you are gaining much shorter startup time uh, as well as better runtime performance, which is generally speaking a pretty good trade-off to make. You don't compile your app as often as, as it's running, hopefully. Uh, and this also means that uh, because this compile time ahead of time compilation approach, you can generally use at compile static all throughout your uh, Micronaut and Groovy applications uh, because there's very, while you still can certainly use uh, runtime metaprogramming yourself if you if you need to. Um, the Micronaut framework features don't require it. And so generally speaking, you can at compile static almost all of your groovy Micronaut artifacts, controllers, filters, and so forth, uh, which also gives you um, better performance, which is great. And then of course, we all know groovy is great for JVM interoperability. And so you can use groovy classes, groovy, uh, you can write beans in groovy, for example, we're gonna see this uh, in a Java, a Micronaut Java application. Right, and and uh, Micronaut's able to handle that just fine, and you can inject beans written in one language into beans written in another, and so even if your entire application is not written in Groovy, you can certainly uh, use Groovy for you know, maybe a, some sort of a helper uh, class, or for or for tests as we always already mentioned. So there may be uh, uses where Groovy makes more sense for a specific part of your application, even if for some other reason you have to use Java as your uh, main. Uh, application, uh, your main project language. So uh, let's go ahead and look. Okay, so creating a Micronaut application, you should generally go to launch.micronaut.io. Now we talk about jhipster, we're going to look at an alternative to this. But if you just want to spin up a Micronaut application, or even just take a, you know, uh, configure an application and preview it, 
you don't even have to download it. You can use the preview feature on the Micronaut Launch website to actually try out different features and see what the resulting application would look like. So you can pick Groovy as your language and pick uh, Spock for your test framework, um, or you can mix and match and you can probably do some funky things with Kotlin and Spock or, or what have you. So, uh, and of course we have dark mode. So check out the launch, Micronaut Launch website, really cool app written in Micronaut and there's a lot more we can say about that, but we don't have time. So let's whirlwind through a few basics of Micronaut before we go, go on to the other rest of our content. Uh, Micronaut has a full feature dependency injection container that's based on the Java X inject annotations primarily. Uh, this approach, again, we talked about ahead of time compilation, so there's no need for runtime reflection to analyze your classes at runtime and, and create beans. Uh, the necessary bytecode needed to do that is created at compilation time. And so the way this generally works, this is an example, it's, it's more or less uh, showing what the what it would look like uh, if, if this was an annotation processor, but the same uh, approach is taken with the AST transformations and Groovy. So Micronaut visits your source code, analyzes it, and then creates bean definitions uh, in bytecode alongside your classes in the same package. Your classes are not modified, your code, your bytecode, is, uh, bytecode that comes from your classes is not changed. There's no transforming going on, unlike some other uh, other frameworks that also attempt to provide these sorts of ahead of time features. Uh, Micronaut is very careful not to touch your code. It just generates um, bean definitions and other other classes alongside of your classes. So what does this look like in practice? So to create a bean, so the, uh, a dependency injection aware class. Uh, in your project, you simply uh, create a class. Um, of course, this is Groovy, so we don't have to make it a public class. And we annotate it with at singleton. Now note, that, and uh, I believe Sergio mentioned this in his talk as well. Um, notice that when you do at singleton, if you're doing this in IntelliJ, for example, and you're writing a Groovy class, at singleton is a Groovy annotation as well with a different package. And it's already at present in the, uh, it's already, it's uh, automatically imported for you. And so if you just type at singleton and you don't do an import, you'll be using the Groovy singleton and you'll be wondering why your Groovy bean is not being instantiated. Make sure you import the Java X uh, annotation. Uh, just a little tidbit there. I've seen that hang up, uh, it's, it's caught me before. So just be aware of that when you're writing a Groovy uh, Micronaut bean. So uh, to create a controller, we annotate it with at controller and we have a, 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 a we can now, um, inject this bean that we created previously using the Java X inject annotation that we see here. Now the alternative for injection, and this is actually what we often recommend to folks, is to create a constructor and use constructor injection. There's some advantages to doing this that it makes it easier to debug, and e not debug, easier to, to mock your class, right? So if I wanna create a mock version of my controller, if I at inject the message helper, there's not really an easy way for me to supply it at, during a test. Um, and so a constructor is a, is a more um, explicit way of, of declaring your dependencies. Um, and so that's also supported. Um, so that's basic in dependency injection. Let's look at configuration. So Micronaut supports all sorts of configuration formats, YAML, JSON, Java properties files, but it also supports Groovy, as I mentioned previously. And uh, Micronaut has environment det detection. You can have configuration for specific environments. That can be the dev environment and the production environment. It can also be the cloud environment or it could be the AWS environment. And so it's able to detect what platform it's actually running on and support uh, environment specific configuration that way. Uh, we already looked at an example of a controller. Here's a controller with a simple method, uh, a, a, a git method declared. And notice that here is a client. And notice that the annotation, we went from an at controller to an at client, but the method signature stayed the same. And that's really cool. That's a, a very common way of writing clients and, and controllers when you're dealing with a, like a microservice federation, um, you can use basically the same API. In fact, you might even extract that and create a shared library that has interfaces that declare these methods and then the controller implements them and then the client extends them and you can uh, enforce a, a common contract that way. Uh, management endpoints, these are very similar to the Spring Boot actuator, if you're familiar with that in either Spring Boot or in Grails. And I'm not gonna talk in detail about that, just mention that they're there because they're gonna come up in our demo shortly. So this allows you to, this allows you to enable these endpoints to provide information about what beans are, you, are in your uh, application context, what are, the, what are the health metrics on your application, what are the, what's the current logging configuration, and so forth. So, um, Micronaut and Groovy, we've already kind of talked about this. So you can create a, 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 a Micronaut application entirely in Groovy. 
Um, and if you do that, you can have, and you, if you use the Micronaut CLI, you can then create controllers that will be created in Groovy and the whole thing can be in Groovy. Um, but there's also the use case of creating a, a Groovy uh, artifacts within a Java Micronaut application, um, which is something that, that uh, we certainly see quite often. And that's what we're gonna be looking at when we come to jhipster. Uh, I think I've got duplicate uh, slides here, so I apologize for that. I'm just gonna run th through this. So. That brings us to jhipster. So what is jhipster? Because uh, now we're talking about something kind of completely different. jhipster is a development platform is how they describe it. Uh, jhipster.tech is the website for building, um, I like to say it's for building uh, modern JVM web apps, right? So it's a project generator in a sense. It creates both a back end and a front end. And that was initially kind of the, the rationale for it. It was a way to create Spring Boot apps with an Angular front end. Um, and now they, they've extended that. And they now support other front ends like React and Vue.js. And we also, and they also now support uh, through uh, development sponsored by my employer, by OCI. Um, we now have a Micronaut backend for jhipster as well. So this means that you can generate a project with a modern single page application front end and a Micronaut application as the back end. And it also supplies a bunch of uh, really cool features like uh, user administration, um, the management endpoints I talked about briefly, you, th those are exposed with a nice UI. It allows you to create sort of scaffolding. If you're familiar with Grails, it can act, you can define your domain class entities in a sense, and it will generate uh, both the persistence classes, repositories and such, as well as the UI uh, components to allow you to create, you know, do cr CRUD uh, operations. It makes it really easy to enable OAuth 2. And then they have this really cool uh, domain language that, that lets you define your domain model and then it will, uh, JFS will read that and create the entity classes, create the controllers, create the repositories. And again, it, it works like scaffolding and grails if you're familiar with it. And it's really powerful. It's the, literally the, the only way we have, the, the only thing close to scaffolding when it comes to Micronaut is uh, the feature offered uh, by jhipster. And so jhipster has a Micronaut blueprint, which was a sponsored by and developed by object computing largely. It's still in active development, so there's still stuff going in there, still features being added, but we already support a lot of features like Maven or Gradle as a build uh, tool, uh, MySQL, Postgres or H2 as database options, JWT or OAuth 2 authentication, and then you can have either an Angular or React app as your single page you know, client application. Now, why would you be interested in using jhipster? Well, it's a great way of getting a, a non-trivial application. In fact, we use this to generate uh, benchmarks, right? If we want to create a benchmark that's a realistic application, not just a hello world example, uh, jhipster gives that to you. So it's it's all it's pretty you know uh, bare bones code, but it does give you a good set of uh, very logical features that you might want to have in an application. It's a great way to quickly put together a application with CRUD, with user management, and with OAuth too. And even if you may not decide to use this as your, to, to turn it into your application, it's still a great way to learn some best practices on how to implement some of these features. And it's just, it's just really impressive to be able to get that whole set of features um, up and running this quickly, like you can do with jhipster. Um, and to use it, uh, it's as simple as, you will need to use NPM. Uh, it is a, a NPM package. So uh, if you're gonna create a, a jhipster application with Micronaut, which is what we're interested in doing, you install it with J generator jhipster micronaut. You wanna install that globally, of course, because it gives you a CLI tool, uh, which is called mhipster. So the stock jhipster with Spring Boot is called jhipster. The, when you add the micronaut blueprint, the, the command is called mhipster. And so uh, you create a folder for your application. That's one gotcha. It does not create a blank folder for you. So be aware of that. If you just say mhipster and you're in your home directory, you're gonna create application code in your home directory. So create a, create a folder, create a directory, CD in there, and then you can run mhipster and um, create the project. Now, what about Groovy? We've been talking about Groovy and Micronaut integration. Well, it turns out that jhipster projects are Java projects. They don't really have an alternate language as an option right now. However, it's not that hard, it turns out, to add Groovy to your Micronaut jhipster project. Just takes a little bit of build configuration that we're gonna look at. And then once you do that, you can now use do things like use Groovy for your uh, application configuration. You can use uh, Micronauts, uh, you can use uh, obviously the, the DI capabilities of Micronaut with Groovy classes and inject them into Java classes. And I think we're just gonna jump right into the demo um, because uh, that will be the best way to show off how this happens. Now, the process of actually creating a JavaScript project and bootstrapping it will take some time, takes time simply because you have to download the internet, right? To 
you know, build the this NPM project and things like that. So I'm not going to do it from scratch because I would use up our time uh, waiting uh, for things to download. But I'm going to go ahead and show you the steps you would go to create a project, and I'll show you the, the finished product, and I'll point highlight the things that are are um, relevant to using Groovy. And again, this is like generally applicable to using Groovy in a Micron application that is not generated as a Groovy application, right? You've got a Micron app that was written in Java or maybe Kotlin, and now you want to introduce Groovy into it. That's the scenario we're looking at here. And jhipster is the tool we're using to generate that project. So let's go ahead and I'm going to turn off my screen share here briefly because I need to share uh, my other display. So bear with me here. All right, we're gonna get a little bit of a, let me move this over, we won't. Okay, here we go. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen here shortly. All right, I'm thinking that might be, so I'm putting in the chat if this, um, if this resolution is actually usable or if I need to adjust it somehow. Hopefully you're using a big enough monitor that it's not a problem. Okay, Soren says it's all good, so let's go ahead, let's go for it. All right, so let's jump over uh, and look at, uh, so here's the jhipster website, but that's not where you're gonna go to create your application. To do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new project. So let me open up uh, my terminal here. All right, so I'm gonna CD into my talks directory here, and I'm gonna see if I should have, let me make sure I'm using the right version of, of uh, NPM. So I use MVM, Node Version Manager. Look it up, great way to manage multiple versions of Node. All right, and that's very small, thank you. Uh, that's easy to make big though. So, whoa, what happened? Terminal, where'd you go? I made it too big apparently. Um, sorry folks, trying to uh, fix this here. Apparently I made my terminal so big that it just jumped a monitor. Did not know it could even do that. Okay, well, hopefully that's big enough. <laughs> All right, so I've already got that installed. So now I can go ahead and, and create a directory. So I'm gonna make there um, a jhipster sample. And I'm going to go ahead and CD into that and run the mhipster command. Now this is going to walk me through, I'm not gonna wait for this all to complete because it would, just, it would take more time than we have. I'm just gonna walk through the uh, project creation wizard uh, with you folks. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna let me choose uh, the options that I want for this application, uh, this project, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and create a monolithic application. What that means is that there will be a single page app front end. If, if I create a microservice um, application, there'll be no front end, which is fine, but it's not what I wanna show right now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and leave all the, take all the defaults. We're gonna use JWT authentication. I highly recommend though, if you wanna know how OAuth 2 works in Micronaut, uh, go ahead and, and uh, try try that with jhipster because the, it's a uh, it comes with a, a, a Docker container that runs Keycloak uh, as your OAuth 2 provider. Just a very easy way to get started. Whoops, I made a mistake. All right, well, well, let's keep going. I used I meant, meant to choose Gradle, but I chose Maven, which is the default. So you go through all these options, and it creates a Git repository, and then it's going to go through and generate all my application uh, files. Now I'm not gonna wait for this to finish because I didn't have to run npm install and download the internet. So I'm going to uh, let this go on in the background and show you a running project, which is already up and running. So what you're gonna see now is what you would see if you generate a project and just fire it up and go to the browser uh, without really doing anything uh, interesting yet. So this is just the default jhipster experience. So here is the home page. So this is a, uh, I believe this is a React front end. Um, I could be wrong on that. I can't remember if I created this with React or Angular, but this is a single page application, right? So as I browse through it, like I have to log in first or I can't do anything. Uh, but as I browse through it, I'm not uh, changing, uh, I'm not actually, you know, it's not reloading pages from the server. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign in. Notice that jhipster gives me some uh, authenticate, authenticatable users uh, in my database so I can log in. And I get this uh, this really cool basic application. I can go here and I can manage my, I can see and manage uh, the users that were created for me. So I've got a system user, an admin, and a uh, plain old user. This is using Micronaut security. So again, it's a great way to kind of see how some of the features of Micronaut work together. Uh, because I, you can go here and check this out and see how Micronaut security has been implemented. Um, and in this case, we're not using OAuth 2, but if we were, we would go through an OAuth 2 flow to authenticate. 
And if we go over here to our administration menu, we can see that we have these uh, various endpoints we can go to. These are actually the management endpoints. So uh, similar to the Spring Boot actuators, uh, but we've got this really cool user interface that we can use to, um, to view them. We can view all of the currently, currently loaded configuration. Again, this is Micronaut. Micronaut's providing this information. JHipster is just giving us a UI that we can see it. And then if we go here to the logs, this is one of my favorites, we can view all of our uh, logger configuration. We can also, at runtime, change the log levels. So I can change them at any level. I can change. I can put everything on to um, just turn all logs off. Um, give that a second here. Anyways, that should work after a while. Might be taking it a, a bit to come back. But you can click on these buttons here. Yeah, there it goes. So I've just turned all the logging off that was the, everything that was nested underneath the root logger. Um, probably not a good idea. I'm guessing that it takes a while because it's so many loggers to be configured. So this uh, this is interactive, right? You can actually uh, interact with the Micronaut application through this user interface, which is pretty cool. And I mentioned, um, so I, I mentioned JDL. JDL is this kind of DSL that uh, JHipster has that allows you to spe create, uh, specify a domain, domain entities, domain classes, if you will. And then it, it will import those and generate the actual uh, Java code needed to support those. I've already done that here. So if I go over to my example, I can see I've got three entity types available. And if I go in here, I get the CRUD operations that you would expect, right? I can create, create a new entity. Um, oops, wrong button, but that's okay. You, you get the point. I can edit, I can delete. So I've got all these uh, uh, features available essentially for free. And it just gives you, you know, again, that rapid scaffolding type of user experience that if you're familiar with Grails, you, you, might, uh, you might appreciate. And even if not, you probably will find uh, ben, uh, you know, ways to benefit from this. And again, you might just benefit from it as a template, as an example of uh, how you can implement this in your own application. Uh, that's perfectly, perfectly reasonable. So uh, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show. We can see user settings. So this is all, what is generating a token? I see a question. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that's referring to, but uh, if you're referring to authentication, uh, that's being generated by Micronaut Security, um, which is what we're using for user for um, for authentication uh, in this example. If we were using OAuth 2, of course, then that would be handled by our OAuth 2 authentication provider. And um, so let's take a look now at, um, I'll, uh, I'll save that question for later. Good question about JFG versus Grails. Okay, so let's look now what it takes to add Groovy to this mix. What we're basically looking at now is a Java Micronaut app, right? with a single page application. So it's a very plausible scenario, a very re reasonable uh, project that you might work on that you might wanna add uh, Groovy to. So let's take a look at what it takes. It's actually surprisingly little. Um, so the first thing you're gonna need to do is add a couple of extra dependencies uh, to allow you to both create Groovy uh, beans, Groovy classes as beans. Um, and that's gonna be this inject Groovy. This, this is the AST transformations we've been talking about. Uh, up here, we can see um, if you're, um, this might also be too small of code, I realized. Uh, come on, what's the way to make that bigger? Uh, yep. Apologize, I can't remember the keyboard shortcut. Um, presenter mode, that doesn't really work for me. Um, editor. Sorry about this, folks. I'm just going to try to up my um, font size real fast. There we go. Let's try 20. There we go. All right, hopefully that's gonna be easier for folks to read. All right, so uh, up here we have the annotation processor, um, Micronaut inject Java. So this is the annotation processors used by Micronaut to handle Java classes. But to handle Groovy classes, we have to use AST transformations and that's what we're loading here. And then the uh, Micronaut runtime Groovy, if you're in Sergio's talk, by the way, this is all review because he talked about this. Um, Micronaut Runtime Groovy, this is what's gonna allow us to use Groovy application configuration, uh, for example. So uh, the next thing we have to do, however, in order to allow um, the joint comp compiler to help us out so that both um, Micronaut and, uh, so that both Java and Groovy classes can, can see each other, right? Um, we have to uh, alter our configuration, our co compilation, um, settings a little bit, and we're going to use Groovy to handle the Java source as well. Um, and we're going to basically turn off the Java source set, um, and that's going to allow Groovy uh, to handle the compilation, delegate to the Java to Java C, 
and allow the classes to be able to uh, allow Java classes to be able to import uh, a Groovy class, for example. Um, that's really the only reason why I had to add, to add that. If I was doing this the other way around, importing the Java class into the Groovy class, uh, I wouldn't need this extra step. So uh, that's just to give us the, the better joint compilation. Um, that's correct. This, we're not using Spring Security here. This is all Micronaut uh, security. And then, uh, well, we'll talk about Spock here in a minute. Let's go ahead and look at what we can do now that we've added these dependencies. So we can we now have a source main Groovy source directory alongside our Java directory. So let me expand this a little bit so we can see the project structure. Close these, close that. So this is fairly typical of how a micro application looks, but there's some extra stuff that's been added by jhipster, um, like the webpack directory, the source main web app um, directory. This is all added by jhipster to support the uh, client of uh, the React or Angular front end. So all of the jhipster generated code is in source main Java, right? Because jhipster is a Java project generator. So the code it creates, the application class, that's all in Java. But because we've added the Groovy dependency, oh, and of course we've also added the Groovy um, uh, uh, Gradle plugin, right? That's important. So we've added that. We added our, our Micronaut Groovy dependencies. And now what we can do is we can create a controller like we see here written in Groovy. And this controller will work right alongside the Java controllers, no issue. Let me go ahead and see an example. Let's see an example of that real fast. I've created this new endpoint, uh, Groovy message. Hello from Groovy. So that's the message that we see returned um, by this message helper right here. So notice, notice that we're in, uh, we've got our at singleton class and now we're all set to inject this into our controller. Uh, and of course, we can also inject this into a uh, Java controller as well. I believe I had an example of that as well. Let me see if I can find it. Yep, here it is. So notice that in the Groovy, so this is a Java controller, right? Client forward controller dot Java. And notice that while, whereas in the first example, I use the inject annotation. In this example, I'm using constructor um, injection. So I've got a private final uh, message helper uh, field, and then I've got a constructor that sets it. And Micronaut is going to inject this Groovy bean into my Java controller and it prints out the message. And I won't take the time to demo that for you. Just try, take my word for it. It does work. Um, and it just uh, returns the message. Actually, let me see, it might just be up and running. Oh, there it is. So you can't see the difference because it's returning the same message. But notice that um, I'm hitting a Java controller now and I'm getting back my uh, the response that's coming from a groovy, uh, uh, groovy bean in my application context. So that's cool, but we can also use other Groovy features, uh, Groovy features, excuse me. So notice that my message controller here is implementing a trait, demo controller trait. If I go ahead and take a look at that, this is a Groovy trait that is basically adding a controller action, a controller method to any any class, any bean, doesn't have to be a controller, any, um, well, yeah, I'm sorry, it would have to be a controller, it wouldn't work. Uh, any controller that extends this trait uh, is now going to get this additional endpoint, uh, this trait message. Um, and so you can see that we have a slightly different um, URI on it. And if I go to Groovy message, that's my controller, and I go to slash trait, that's my trait provided method, I get back my message, hello from a Groovy trait. So traits are usable in Micronaut. They're usable in a Micronaut Java application if you have the proper dependencies like we just looked at. So uh, that's pretty cool. What we can also do, however, um, and uh, if you notice, so I've got security turned on here. Uh, and that means that by default, any non and any endpoint that's not explicitly allowed is going to be it's going to require authentication. Right. I would get a 401 normally. So in order to enable these, I have to add these uh, routes. I either have to add an at security annotation, uh, which you might be familiar with if you use Spring Security. Right. So I can add, add secure and I can say is anonymous. And IntelliJ is not helping me out right now, but it's a security rule is anonymous, right? So I could do that and, and open this up. Or what I can do is I can set it through configuration. Thank you for the heads up, Soren. Here's the last uh, bit of the demo. If I go here to my source main resources directory, this is where Micronaut configuration lives. You can see I've got a YAML configuration, which is the default, but because I have the correct dependency, I can also use my application.groovy configuration file. And that's what I'm doing right here. And the important thing to note here is I'm using Groovy maps. I'm using uh, the map syntax in Groovy 
to specify my intercept URL map. So this is how I configure my security rules. And you can see here is where I've, I've indicated the, um, the method of uh, the additional controller actions that I added. So I'm using Groovy, which is cool because uh, the YAML way of configuring this is kind of tedious and not that easy to read. And so it's kind of nice to use Groovy in this example. And there might be other cases where you want to iterate over these things and, and do something interesting. So, um, and Paul's here to remind me to wrap up. And I'm pretty much done. Let me, um, the right Paul. Don't two minutes if, if you don't want to answer any questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's see. I'll just drag this over here so I don't have to mess up screen share anymore. Um, and then we'll just conclude and take on whatever questions are still are still there. So we've got, yeah. So Micronaut is a powerful performance framework for JVM apps, including uh, apps written in Groovy or using Groovy. JHipster lets you quickly bootstrap an, a full feature application with Micronaut using very little of your own code. And then with a bit of extra configuration, and I will have a, the link to this uh, source this project yeah, on the slides when they're uploaded, uh, you can take advantage of Groovy in this JHipster Micronaut application. And this is applicable to any Micronaut project where you're, you're using Java as your main language, but you want to bring Groovy into the mix. That is all, and I'll take whatever questions I can gather. Thanks, Zach. That was very, very interesting. Um, okay. Have you actually used uh, that combination in any, any um, sort of production systems or? Um... Production systems, I'm trying to think. I've definitely used Groovy for Spock testing in production, you know, Java micro applications. I'm not sure if, if I recall if I've used a Java micro application and use Groovy for specific beans. I can imagine a lot of scenarios where I think that would make sense. But I don't I mean, know. I mean, I mean the, the Jay Hipster stuff. Oh, it's Jay Hipster. No, I've not taken Jay Hipster in, into production. And I'm not sure um, it's quite ready for that yet, at least the Micronaut portion, because it's still in a very early development phase. Um, it's great for for uh, bootstrapping up, up an application, learning Micronaut, learning single page applications. There's a lot of, 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 of um, really helpful information kind of embedded into the project. Um, but yeah, the Micronaut uh, the blueprint is still being actively developed. And so I don't, I don't know of anyone who's taken it into production um, as of yet. Yep. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. That was a great talk. Great. Well, thank you. I'm just rolling up the, the chat here to see if there are any more questions that I should respond to. But yep, I think folks are free to go on to the next session. Okay. Next session should start in about one minute. Thanks, everyone.